We're talking about the logos and we're talking about reaching people for the loss. So I have a little story. And the story is told about a young man that grew up in a war zone. He grew up in a place where if you say the wrong things, you get shoot. If you go to the wrong place, you get shoot. If you look different, you get shoot. If you don't believe what others do, guess what? You get shoot. That's right, you get it. And because of his love to the English language, he met a missionary at the age of 11 and going to their devotional sessions only to hear English, the Lord called him onto his own and gave his heart to the Lord at 11 years old. But then we were told that this young man's life took a turn. He was selected to act on TV. He was selected to do a lot of social events and all that get to his head. So by the age of 14, 15, that young man lost his way. And the things of the world overtook what the Lord has started in his heart and life. And fate, as then that young man thought, removed him from that war zone and took him to a country he knows nothing about. And that country is Russia. Uh, anybody watching football, by the way? Yeah, there he is. Yeah, good. So this is where they're playing football, in Russia. By the way, one of the stadiums in Russia named is Kazan, too, huh? Just thought I would boast a little bit. <laughs> so that young man went to Russia, to a country that he doesn't know nothing about, he doesn't know the language, to study. And two years down the road after him studying, at 10 o'clock at night, I want you young people to go tonight and Google something called the Red Square in Moscow. It's a big square where they call it the heart of Russia. This young man walking down the Red Square with his Russian girlfriend on his side, a bottle of vodka in his inside coat, and drunk like a skunk. However, as he thought the fate will have it, but we all know that it is God, the same missionary who happened to be his uncle that prayed for him at age of 11 had sent him one of those headphones, Walkman tape, Hosanna tapes. So that young man at the age of 18 years old walking down Red Square with his Russian girlfriend on his side, bottle of vodka in his pocket, and a Hosanna tape Walkman in his ears. How that three things get together, don't ask me. A Russian girlfriend, a bottle of vodka, and Hosanna tape worshiping. And at 10 o'clock at night, an old lady at the time and this is 1990, was 86 years old, an American lady by the name of Virginia Pike, from the state of Virginia, handed this young man a little track in Russian that says, Jesus loves you, and said in English, she did not know Russian, here you go. So that young man, love of English, rekindled and looked at her in English, so proud he can speak English, and said, thank you. She was excited that he said thank you, that he knows English in a country when then nobody spoke English. She doesn't know Russian. She said, you speak English? He said, yes. The first question, she said, do you know Jesus? But something hit him. Why? Because he's having of a high blood concentration of vodka, a Russian girlfriend on his side, and a Hosanna tape in his 
ears playing. And she said, do you know Jesus? As we Bajan said, I've been here 23 years, right? So I'm learning to be Bajan too. So in his heart, he goes, where? What I gonna tell she? Right? Close it up. Okay, good. <laughs> he did not know what to answer. And the only thing that came out of his mouth was, well, before, he took the headphones and put it on her. And she started in the middle of the Red Square at 10 o'clock at night saying, Chris, hallelujah, this man is a Christian. He said, wait, 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 hold your horses, wait, wait. And the only thing that this young man could say was, I know about Jesus. I don't know him anymore. And that was the end of that young man worldly life. To make a long story short, this young man right there and then looked at the young girl, called a taxi, sent her home with an apology, emptied a bottle of vodka on the ground and threw away the empty bottle and kneeled down at quarter past one in the morning after a long discussion with Geneva Pike and recommitted his life to Christ. This young man stands before you today to testify that nothing will separate us from the love of God. No wars, no bombs, and trust me, we've seen a lot. No bullets, no alcohol, no glories, and no acting, and no social life, no height, no depth, no principalities, no powers, no demon in hell will separate us from the love of God. Let me quickly bring these two points together. Had this old, blessed Geneva Pike did not follow the call of God on her life, Althea, and went and left the comfort of her home in Virginia, in the US, all the way down to Russia, at 10 o'clock at night at minus 28 degrees Celsius and found this wretched guy and told him that Jesus loves him. All of that would not have happened. So if you think you are too... There was a young man with a guitar. What's your name? I can't hear you. Can somebody tell me what's your name? Nathan. Nathan. If, if you are as young and blessed as Nathan with this his lovely little guitar, or you are as old as I am, don't let me tell anybody else that old, I get in trouble, so I will talk about myself. If you're old, as old as I am, you are never young or old enough to serve God. Let me also, I'm not going to be too long, just three, four hours, so bear with me. Let me also <laughs> link two things together that to me, it's always an honor and privilege to come somewhere where you know nobody. Nobody knows you. I've never been here. I fast on this road because I've been in Barbados for a while. And for seeking the Lord of what am I to share with you for the last week, 
and the Lord, I believe, gave me a word for the youth and a word for discipleship and continuity, and I'm getting there just now. To come here, and the first thing I hear from pastor is that I am soon going to be handed over to my son, and then to hear from the platform, the retirement, and to have Chris with us about the youth. And then you, you, you think, really? Who am I for that such a great God to give a word to exactly what the people talking and need? To me, it's beyond humbling. It's, it's, it's something like you yourself can do. We cannot come out with that. So, if anybody among us or anybody outside still doubt that there is a God, I'm sorry if I want to... Right? Yeah. Yes. They're walking. I'm really sorry for us if we still have our doubts. Chris will have better things to do in his time. But he answered the call of God to go after the youth of this country. Amen. When we drive around and see these young men and women on the block, we should not be hearing it. We should be out there talking to them. You know, there's a, a, an old pastor at Abundant Life, Pastor Q. He passed away and be with the Lord now. He used to say, why somebody will have the opportunity to hear the gospel three and four and five times when there are still people that never heard it once. Young and old, if you're looking for a mission field, open the door and go to your neighbor. Missionaries are not only Althea and the OM and Chris and Ziad and Pastor and your, and your worship team that serve God in their communities. It's about us. It's about, it's about kingdom business too. Business people, employees. Your companies is a mission field. So you don't have to go so far. You know, Jesus said, start with New Jerusalem, Samaria, and, and to the end of the world. So our mission field is that rum shop right there across the road. Let me give you a quick story about Bosco when we first started doing missions on the road. We used to go and sit down in the subway, the, the underground train, and there would be punks and drug addicts and so on, and we would sit down with them. we tear our shirts and shoes and things, and we would sit down. And I'm talking, we sit down there every night for five and six and seven months. Don't say a word. Get their trust. And when, when that joint of we pass around, you pick it up and you pass it around and you don't say a word. Yeah. Four months later, the leader of that gang came and said, Ooh, wait, you've been here and I see you passing the darn thing. You take it and you pass it. But I've never seen you once taking a, whatever you call it, a, a puff. Yes, thank you. Wait, who said puff? How do you know? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> taking a puff. I said to him, I said, because what you are seeking from that puff, I experience higher heights, pun intended from something else it's called Jesus and the Holy Spirit so if you want to get high like me higher than you can ever high get high come talk to me and I'm here to testify that same young man is now a youth pastor in Moscow so these are some stories that missions and mission fields and what we can do but let me share a little bit with you from some meat it's Sunday so Sunday usually is meat day if, if, if you know anything about Middle Eastern people we love our food 
my, yes, my wife is a great cook. I am happily and blessedly married for 18 years. My wife is the best thing after Jesus that ever happened to me. I am sorry they could not come today, but my daughter is, is um, I have a 17-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son. She is involved in a dance show this afternoon, so they're all, you know, involved and crazy about it, so. But um, let's get to some meat on Sunday, okay? Um, the pastor tell me you're here to minister. So I will try my best and you pray for a miracle to finish in 20 minutes. Because I don't think I will, but anyway. Are you in a hurry? Wait, it looks like yeah. Are you in a hurry? No, okay, good. Um, again, for the sake of time, just follow with me. You don't need to open the scriptures and so on. And we're gonna go in a couple of steps because it's important. I wanna talk to us about the church as a whole, some of the key points in the church as a whole, Pastor, and again, as God will have it, we want to share specifically about discipleship and continuity. And when, when I do this, you know what I mean, right? Right. It's always awesome. To see that the work that God has started as he promised will always continue and it will go from glory to glory to glory but guess what they can't do it without you Chris cannot do it without his committee pastor can't do it without the ministers and the worship team and the outreach team For the church to function effectively, there is a couple of attributes and a couple of gears that they need to mesh. Something like we call principles. And these principles, to name a few, can be holiness, purity, the word, and I'm not calling them in any important order, I'm just picking them up. Unity, one vision, purpose, winning the laws, discipleship, and continuity. We're going to speak today a little bit about discipleship and continuity. And we're going to address some of the points that discipleship will bring as fruit to the church. And we're going to address sometimes the young people to understand continuity. In Amos... 3 7 that's chapter 3 verse 7 it says surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants the prophets so God is a God of order he doesn't just come and make things up he chooses wretched people like myself and all the one of wretched people too, he choose you too. By the way, if you get offended about my jokes, again, I'm sorry for that. Right. He reveals his secrets, plans, vision, and even the logistical way how to do things, if we seek him enough, Chris. Because your youth convention, I am sure you have a prayer committee that show you even which sound system to rent, who to deal with. You testify to that? So God is a God of order. He reveals. 
But I want you to understand something I not too long ago was able to grasp. In the old days, the Spirit of God used to speak to people, sometimes audibly. But guess what? The Spirit of God came upon them for a time. Now, my hero in the Bible, Nathan, where's Nathan? He found out. My hero in the Bible is Samson. Samson was my hero. I love strength, I love muscles and things. So my hero is Samson. But even the great Samson, the, the, if you study his, what happens exactly to him, he says even when he gets righteous anger or when he gets to do anything for God, the Spirit of God came upon him for that particular time. He started to shake and get strong and do what God told him or directed him to do. The great thing, however, that we now have, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is with us every minute, every second of our life, and we can even do greater things. But to do greater things, we need to what? Submit. We cannot just get up one morning and say, I'm going to do greater things. You need to be equipped. I love muscles and I love strength. So if I'm going to go now and fight a boxing fight, I'm going to kick myself in the butt and I'm going to get kicked so hard it's not even funny. Why? Because I never trained to be a boxer. I was never equipped. I did not watch boxing. I did not listen to the coach. I do know nothing about boxing. So I just can't pick up and go. If you are called to be a missionary and come to speak to Althea, to go to Moldova, you cannot just pick up and go. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to read. You need to sit down under the counsel of your leaders and say, what is it? You need to be spiritually covered. Somebody praying for you. Somebody can ascend you spiritually and financially. So Amos tells us that God will not do anything without revealing. And this is how the work here started. Pastor, God revealed to you to start this 36 years ago. Amen. Absolutely. When you even build this in 2004, you had a vision from, you listened, you heard. But I don't know how long you even sought God to pray for this building. Maybe another 10 years before. So, sit down and seek God. That's the moral of this. And I want to submit to you, my dear friends. Don't think that seeking God is only for the big things. So I want to buy a house, I will sit down and seek God. I want to buy a car, I will seek God. I want to go on mission, I will seek God. Getting up in the morning, opening your window, and saying, Lord, thank you for life. What is it you have me to do today is as seeking God, as seeking Him for a big mortgage or a house or a car. Seeking God to be somebody's smile today or to be able to put a smile on somebody's face today is seeking God. Seeking God is a lifestyle. is not a formula. Oh, I have a decision, so let me see, let me see God. Because I have that. No, 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 no. It's a lifestyle. It's every minute and every second. You know why? Because he's there. We just said that in the old days, the Spirit came upon them for a time. But since he's with us all the time, whether we seek him not, he's there. It's not a task. We have not because we ask not. Ask and seek. Seek him. He's right there. 
He asks us to seek him not because he's lost, nor because we lost him. He asks us to seek him because he wants that fellowship. I have a 17-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son. And let me tell you, if one day I don't sit down and speak to them, I miss them terribly. My daughter went on a mission trip last month, last, last week. She came back last week for two weeks when she finished her exams. Uh, and, and she had very limited Wi-Fi access. And when the day passed and I can't talk to her, I felt like fish out of water. I missed her terribly. And that only broke, this was the first time my 17 year old daughter, and if any of you men have daughters, you will understand how father and daughter relationship is, very special. When I could not talk to my daughter, I felt like fish out of water. And it only, this was the first time she left home and slept out, first time ever. We don't believe in, in, in uh, what do you call them? Sleep, sleep over, yes, thank you, sleepovers. I don't do no sleepovers. I'm an old fashioned type of father, so forgive me. Uh, the first time she went away and slept outside the house, and, and I felt, wait, if I, a wretched person, that have one daughter and one son, and I felt strange, I felt hurt, when I don't hear her for one day. Can you imagine how God feels when we don't talk to him until Sunday? From Sunday to Sunday? You know what we're doing sometimes? And listen, I ain't condemning anybody because I am the, the guiltiest of the guilty. So let me, let me start from the end. We're doing like what we call fish Christians. Or, or, or not fish, let me do it properly. You know the, the water turtle, the sea turtle? Sea turtle, when she wants air, they come up. So this is like Sunday. We go to church and come up and praise God and hallelujah and glory to God. And then during the week, we go down. And between work and children and this and that and extracurricular activity, we forget that we need air every second. And then some Saturday night, oh sure, I need to go back to church. We get up Sunday morning, fix up and dress up and blah, blah, blah. And we come to church and then, but, 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 but this is fish Christians, I call it, up and down. We should be head above water, fellowshipping with Jesus every single minute. Okay. So God reveals his plans to us. But in order to have continuity, in order for the work here to continue, we need to teach and disciple. <clears throat> we need to teach and disciple. Now, teaching and discipling. Teaching and discipling is a responsibility. Guess what? It's not only their responsibility. If you are sitting right there and you look across and you see somebody hurting, you see somebody thoughtful, oh, you put your that. hand on their shoulder and say, Jesus, have you covered this is teaching. This is imparting. This is discipleship. Or look across to the other side this time because you've dealt with this one already and say, were you able to put a smile on somebody's face this week? Were we able to be maybe the only Bible that people will read by the way we live, this is all part of teaching and discipleship. In Isaiah 44, uh, 
and verse 3. It says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. So as much as the leadership will want, push, try, and put all the efforts in teaching, if we are not thirsty, and this is a condition, you ain't going nowhere. Pastor, I know that I am hitting below the belt, and I am leaving here. Maybe I might never come back to your church. We have to deal with this after. But guess what? I leave here. And you... I get excited. And floods. I will pour down my spirit. Not only on one of, on one of the descendants too. So it's a generational blessing. It's not only for one of And this is continuity. This is picking up and continuing with the vision. But we need to understand that with the responsibility come accountability. Okay. Let us jump back to Isaiah 43 and verse 19. And this is for you. Specifically, sir, that's for you. Not to take away from the work that the pastor started and continued, but the Bible promises us that we're going to grow from glory to glory. So behold, I will do a new thing. Amen. It shall spring Amen. forth. I will even make a road in the wilderness now I don't know how many of you were in the wilderness there's only sand and rocks he will make a road, a highway a four lane highway for you my dear sir Amen. Amen. the condition is to be thirsty Amen. and rivers in the desert Amen. rivers of living water In Isaiah 54 and verse 2 and this speaks about continuity and here I am not talking physical I am not speaking about structure building or numbers of churches even though that comes but I believe in my heart I might be wrong that comes as a fruit if we enlarge the place of our tent our spiritual tent if we enlarge our vision if we enlarge our capacity and we will stretch out the curtains of our dwelling if when Jesus was crucified that curtain was separated and open how much more now the spirit that dwells in us the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will cut down all the curtains in our lives all the barriers in our lives and say go forth for his honor and his glory if any of us seek in our own glory let us go home Ain't worth it. My brother, if you're doing this for gain, for you, come and see me. We'll find some other jobs to do. We'll find something. But this is for God and for them and for continuity and for reaching the loss. This is not for us. Don't spare any efforts to lengthen our cords. So we can fish. So we can tie down the tent. So we can put down roots, spiritual roots. And all the additional churches and all the satellite churches and all the buildings and all this land will come as a fruit. 
you don't put the cart before the horse. You don't build the building. And, and you know, I'm gonna get in trouble here because I'm gonna get in trouble with those people that talk about prosperity gospel and I believe God wants us to prosper, so let me put that very straight. But you don't build a 2,000 seat building and put yourself in debt and you have 10 people in congregation. Go bring the laws, let them sit down on top of each other and then go build the building. In my business, we produce windows and doors. I don't go order raw materials for 10,000 windows if I only have 100 windows in production. Does that make sense? Good. I'm not in trouble yet, Pastor. I'm good? You're not going to kick me out yet? Good. Good. See? Now we're talking. We're accustomed to this. Did I say that all night? Okay. <laughs> we're going to jump across to 2 Timothy. And I know I am all over the place in the scripture, but the principle is there. 2 Timothy, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. If anything speaks about continuity in the Bible is this verse. Because Paul is saying to Tim, everything I've taught you, and everything that I told you to concentrate on, commit all of them to you and to others. Don't hug the information. If we cannot grow Chris and bring somebody along with us, we fail. If we cannot impart our knowledge, we fail. If we are too insecure because of clinching to power, that I cannot pass on everything I know and some more to my team, I fail. But why he's asking him to pass this on? Because again, he said, pass this on to others so they can also bring others. Continuity. Let me go back to Isaiah 54. <laughs> Excuse me. Isaiah 54 and the whole passage from 9 to 17 but we're not going to read it all I'm going to highlight two points from there one verse 10 that says for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed but my kindness shall not depart from you nor shall my covenant of peace be removed says the Lord who has mercy on us when God revealed, as Amos said, his plan, and we disciple and teach, and we are thirsty, and we teach our congregation to be thirsty, and we bring out of them the potential that sometimes they themselves don't know they have it, and we don't give up on them when they fall, because we sometimes do fall, whether you see it or not and when we do all these things and when we enlarge our territories spiritually and God will pour down his spirit and he will make a road where there is none or seemeth none his mercy and his covenant will not depart now let us put a little bit into perspective see When, when I say I will not, it's different when God said I will not. I am a wretched fellow. My word, I try to live by it, but I can fail you. As much and loving your leadership is, God forbid, sometimes you might think that they failed you. But Jesus will never fail you. 
if he says it, that's it. There's no argument. He's the boss. He's the boss. He's not going to change. So if he said, if you do all these things, my mercy and my grace will not depart, that's the law. I finish. There's no argument. Now, let me ask you something. When you stand in, in those good old days that some of our young people, uh, I don't think the twin will know about it. If, when, when, have you ever sent a postal letter in the post? Of course not, because we're not, we're not millennium. We're not electronically done. We're not bored with electronics anymore. Else. Anyway, when we used to send a letter in the post, you, you're a young man and you would know that. When you used to send a letter to the post and you put it in that box with the stamp and the right address and everything, have you ever called the post office to see if the letter is delivered? Never. Why? Because he trusted the system. You drop the letter and you're gone. You don't look back and ask them. You call them, hello, my letter delivered? If you do that, the woman will think you're mad. No, you trust the system. So if we trust the postal system that is made by men, why then when we go to the cross and say, Lord, I put this on the cross, you get up and pick it up and take it with you. And I do this. I, hello, I'm guilty. So I'm preaching to us. We should trust the system. If we have a need and we put it on the cross, leave it there. When you finish praying, go along by your business and take and leave it there. Amen. Go along. <laughs> leave it there. Even if you don't see the evidence of that healing or answer or whatever it is at that particular time, leave it there. Amen. I've been praying for my healing for 11 years. And I know I'm healed. I might sound mad, but I'm healed. Amen. The symptoms are still there, but I don't care. I'm right. The symptoms, I like this. The symptoms are still there, but I don't care because I know Jesus have it. And even if it never happens, it will not separate me from the love of God because I know where I come from. So I am not judging God by his responses to me. I am following God because of the love. It's the love that moved him. Okay. And then we said we're going to go back to Isaiah 54, 10 to 17. After all of this promises, what he says? Well, going through 14 that says, In righteousness you shall be established, my brother. You shall be far from oppression. Whoever assembles against you, You're going to laugh at them. Because it says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment. Who? 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 Did he say, Every tongue that rises against you, he will come there? He didn't say he. He gave, you the, he gave us the tool. It's we. He gave us the sword of the Spirit. So if he tell me I gotta do it, I gotta go do it. But wait, if, if my son tell me that, take my bicycle and put air in the tire. I'm gonna take the bicycle and put air in the tire. I ain't gonna go back to him and say, well, I took it to the gas station, but here it is, put air in the tire. But he's gonna think again, I'm mad. God said, no weapons form against you shall prosper. And every tongue, hello, every, every. So if this neighbor is talking behind my back, I will commit it to the Lord. But then if this neighbor talk behind my back, I will go quarrel with it. No, it's every, it's this and this. It's both of them. And the one in the front and the one in the back and my boss. 
because nothing gonna separate us from the love of God. And he said, you shall condemn. So get up and fight yourselves. Don't ask anybody to fight for you. Listen, everybody is busy you now. Nobody gonna fight for you, fight for yourself. We have our own battles to fight. Listen, people think that pastor's job is to pray for people. Is our job to pray for them? So Ziad is having a stomach problem and he's been praying for a week and nothing happening. So he decided he's gonna pick up and call pastor nurse. Would you pray for me? Well, you can pray for yourself. I can call pastor nurse and say, would you join me in prayer? Pray with me. Because I've already received the healing. Just believe it with me. Just join me because we're two or three. Yes, he is. So, join. Don't depend on others to fight your battles. Okay. Oh, Lord. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. We need to understand that God is bigger. God is in charge. My 